All right. So let's talk about your 10 questions. If you had Elon Musk in front of you right now, what would be your, they could be questions for 1010. They could be questions for earnings day. They could be questions just because you got the benefit of having them on your channel. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of individual organizations over the course of the last hundred years who've had a huge impact on the development of technology overall. Uh, one of those would be Bell Labs, obviously, but another one of them is going to be Skunk Works, which was run by a gentleman named Kelly Johnson at Lockheed Martin and sure. obviously produced the SR-71 Blackbird. But, you know, Kelly Johnson really oversaw not that project, but the other project, which was the A-12 Archangel, which is the prototype version of the SR-71 Blackbird, which Elon has obviously huge fascination with and love for. And uh, so I'm always curious to know, you know, what has he learned about life, engineering, project management, and technological development from Kelly Johnson and Skunk Works specifically through his love of that project? Um, because, you know, Kelly Johnson was a very innovative character operating inside of, you know, a government bureaucracy and created this, like, uh, I mean, we use the word Skunk Works now. Yeah. Because to of. describe what that was, you know, it's just this incubator of innovation and progress and execution that is able to survive inside of, you know, a big bureaucratic institution like the government that is very exceptional at not getting things done. All right. Question number two. Yeah, definitely would start with RoboTaxi for the time being, since uh, I think, you know, that's that's a thing that we'll actually get answers to here in the near future is, uh, you know, are we just pushing all the way to robo taxis? Um, or is there, you know, a stair stepped rollout plan uh, between here and there, really digging into he, he had a great interview with, um, you know, the all in podcast a couple weeks ago, talking about the difference of the type of software challenge that real world AI is compared to these LLMs. And um, so I'd be curious to hear him comment on Dojo and just the infrastructure compute build out that's going to be necessary to continue that question to solve. Number three? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. So the, do the, the Dojo build out. Okay. Go and ahead. the compute needs to really solve real world applied AI, both for full self driving, but also for the bot, you know, over the next decade. Um, he thinks that the third version of Dojo might be the one that finally is a really good standalone product that is able to compete more effectively against uh, NVIDIA's chips because Jensen is you know, such an incredible entrepreneur and has been able to keep up with the types of pace of progress that uh, Elon has been trying to make on the chips and AI front in-house. Um, so that's, you know, that would definitely be another one. When when, when, um, do, when do you think that that third iteration will be uh, produced? It aligns with, he, he said there's, a, I think, one in 2025 that he was talking about being version two of Dojo. Um, then TSMC has talked about, so we know that Dojo is produced by TMC, TSMC. We know that it is produced using... Uh, a special process that they have developed that allows them to do, you know, where the Dojo D1 tiles are 25, you know, individual chips that are all kind of smushed together on one wafer. Um, the process that allows them to do that is a special process that TSMC pioneered and the Dojo chip is the first chip that actually takes advantage of that process. So they have said that there's a new evolution of that process that then allows them to further chips on top of the, you know, you've got the the 25 individual D1 tiles on the wafer. So they can also put chips on top of those individual 25 D1 tiles. Right. Right. Um, and so that would allow them to co-locate things like the high bandwidth memory mm. right on top of the chips instead of having to go off chip to reach these pieces mm. of memory. That process is slated to come online in late 2026, early 2027. From uh, what I remember uh, off the top of my head from a couple months ago when TSMC had an event. And that aligns with when Elon says that 
the Dojo version three is going to come out. So Dojo version two is going to be a second iteration of Dojo, but it's going to use the same process that the current version of Dojo uses. Dojo version three, I think, is going to use that next generation process from TSMC. And um, that was supposed to provide up to a 40x increase in performance, according to TSMC, in comparison to the Dojo D, the, the version one of Dojo. Um, so, you know, that that's pretty large. We may see an increase of, you know, it could be like a five times increase from Dojo V1 to Dojo V2. And then from there, like an eight to 10 times increase from Dojo V2 to Dojo V3. And that's where things really start to get interesting. All right. Question number four. Got to go back to batteries that, you know, we've definitely seen a slowdown in a lot of the plans of a lot of OEMs. It also took longer for Tesla to be able to achieve both cathode and anode production using their dry cathode process. Um, so commercializing Maxwell technology, you know, has, has taken a little bit longer. And I think that takes a lot of the um, pressure off of lithium mining that, you know, there was going to be potentially in the back half of this decade. And so, yeah, I'd be curious, you know, if, if everything went well, where does he see battery production in 2030? And how does that correlate to the 20,000 or I mean, 20 million vehicle target that was originally given, you know, I, he, we haven't heard him reiterate that in a long time. And I don't think that that is the target. Um, but it would be, it would be interesting to hear more in line with, you know, what they talked about with master plan part three, like how much battery supply for master plan part three goals. Can we really expect in, um, in 2030 given, the final, you know, the breakthroughs that we're seeing in 4680s now, the more exponential ramp, hopefully, that we're going to see in that. And um, then the rollout of more commercial vehicles like Semi and Cybertruck finally hitting the roads. Uh, that would be a big one. Obviously, XAI. So we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Okay. The, uh, you know, what what is the future of XAI and its relationship with all the different Elon Musk entities. So obviously XAI and X, but XAI and Tesla, I think that there's, you know, Elon's really pursuing the future of artificial intelligence in, so real world intelligence being with Tesla and then just traditional LLM traditional. research. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> That's pretty funny. With, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's at least five years old now. <laughs> so <clears throat> doing more of the chat GPT style, uh, development of AI with XAI. Those are really, you know, two different non-correlated bets that are both aimed at kind of the same overall goal. And I'm curious how he thinks about the relationship between those two things long-term, um, how that fits into the plans to colonize Mars uh, <laughs> with SpaceX. So here, this is a super nerdy question. Um that I would love to get an answer to. I want to know, has Elon assigned a task force to investigate putting data centers in orbit with SpaceX instead of having them here on Earth? Uh, just because, you know, there are huge engineering challenges. Cooling things in space is definitely possible. It's not easy. Data centers are hard to cool. Uh, but you can also put a lot of solar panels on satellites in orbit and they can get electricity from the sun for free. And, you know, because they don't have all that atmosphere inhibiting the sunlight, you know, from the surface of the atmosphere all the way to the surface of the earth. And so you could potentially run your, your data centers at a lower amount of like your energy input cost can potentially be lower then uh and you can run them 24 7 if you put them in specific orbits that are uh, basically facing the sun 24 hours a day so what else is there anything else on your list i mean uh probably to to touch on a question we discussed a little bit before we hopped on was uh how hard is the optimus software challenge yeah. compared to the fsd software challenge yeah. and you know we're, we're still pouring a lot of 
resources and time and effort into finishing development of FSD. But really, when you step back and you think about it, FSD is one narrow application of real world AI. intelligence and AI. And we are going to have a whole bunch more of those narrowly applied um, fields to then go and tackle. And uh, yeah, so how are we going to slice and dice the, I, I think there's so much room wide open in the humanoid robot market for different business models, different approaches, um, and different people to be successful. I'm curious to see how Elon and Tesla specifically are thinking about their their go-to-market strategy and based on all the learning that they've had trying to develop FSD as a product, um, what are the next steps of software development for Optimus specifically? You know, most of what they've given us about Optimus up to this point is really about hardware and manufacturability. Um, they've hinted at how they're developing software, but they haven't really told us. And they say that, you know, everything that we've learned from FSD is applicable right. to developing the software for the Optimus robot. But I think that it may be 5% or 10%, you know, optimistically of all of the stuff that needs to get built to make, you know, humanoid robot platforms as a, as a general tool applicable to, you know, general problems for humans. Um, I, I think that we've only begun the software lift to accomplish that. And uh, so that that's going to be another huge, and really that, that leads into the biggest market opportunities for Tesla. So did you have any questions on the energy storage side? The the hard thing about energy is, is really twofold. Regulatory environment is awful on that front. And that's the thing that is going to be slowing down mega pack ramp more than anything else, especially with current lithium prices and current battery prices. Like the bottleneck that we're seeing is just that there are people that have projects planned and they can't, start the project until all the rubber stamps get applied. So um, that's difficult. Then the other piece is that uh, there are, you know, it's not that complicated of a technology. And so you actually do have a lot of competitive pressure from other companies making products, especially within China, which is like China is the big energy growth market. It's bigger than, you know, the, the United States by, by far. And so within China, which is one of the main areas where, you know, they're trying to grow energy deployment. Um, they face competition. Uh, I think that their software is an order of magnitude probably better than any of their competitors. So that should give them an edge long term. Um, so I am really going to watch closely what the Megapack factory in Shanghai does. So if we see them pretty consistently adding on to the factory, will know that they're able to, you know, successfully sell that product pretty well in China. So uh, the the one big one that you didn't have a single question about was the uh, was the semi trucks. Yeah, I think the semi project is in the bag. My only big question about it is what is it going to look like to really get FSD running yeah. on these autonomous semis? Because that's, you know, getting electric semis is Huge. great. Getting autonomous electric semis wow that's where all of a sudden you start looking at transport that's cheaper than rail. And really that's where the prices of everything that has to be transported all around the world, you know, really comes down pretty significantly. And uh, so, yeah, my, my question about semi is what's the, what's the progress on getting FSD. So I have just enough time to ask you my new favorite issue that I just dreamt up the other day while I was preparing my questions for this big question deal. And that is, okay, how do we now uh, develop an entire almost new division of Tesla called Tesla AI, which would have four products. It would sell Dojo chips in competition with NVIDIA. It would sell Dojo as a service in the cloud, which has already been mentioned by Elon. It would sell inference chips for other cars and robots, because they have the best inference chip by far. And then we know also about this business of having the cloud in, in the 
in those inference chips, having the largest inference chip computer in the world that you could sell uh, time on that as well. So uh, those are the first four products that come to mind, but those four together would be a massive, massive business. Do you see that as a future, a future of another future of Tesla that could be another one of the biggest companies in the world all by itself? Oh, well, it definitely could be. The question is whether they will develop those resources at a faster rate than they can use them to where there's any excess capacity to sell them, you know, outside the company. NVIDIA has a big advantage right here, not necessarily because they have the best inference chips, but because they have the best developer platform for inference chips. And that is something that Tesla does not have. You know, they're not super developer friendly. Um, they don't have the infrastructure in place, the culture, the support staff, all of all of that. Um, so it would be hard not, you know, like their chips are good enough, but there's a lot of other challenges in, you know, being able to sell inference, basically edge inference devices at scale um, that I don't see, even though it's a big opportunity, uh, it's going to be a big business segment. I don't see the risk reward for Tesla being worth it to allocate a ton of resources to solving all those problems that are really different kinds of problems than right. Tesla already has a core competency in. On the dojo side, uh, I think that video-based training is going to be a larger and larger component of AI training long-term. And I think that dojo is in the pole position to be the best video training hardware setup in existence.